and welcome to Bread and Thread, a podcast about food and domestic history. I'm Liz. I'm Hazel. We're two people who studied archaeology together and love history. So Hazel, what have you been making since our last episode? Um, oh yeah, that was thing. Um I have been doing a bit more spinning and um I had a thing that I was gonna say. Um what was it? Was it the wine that you tweeted? It was not wine. Oh, I did finish my wine though. Well, I say finish. I didn't do anything. It finished fermenting. <laughs> and then I um siphoned it off into bottles from the demijohn, which was a surprisingly messy process because you have to I would have thought technology would be more advanced by now, but you basically use a tube where you have to suck the air out for the wine to be like siphoned off oh yeah so it's like physics it's kind of cool but you do get wine all over you which depending on how much you like wine may or may not be bad but presumably you also get like a little bit of a taste of it yes i was kind of worried at first because it tasted i thought it was going to be a bit vinegary but um it's actually all right. I think it needs a bit more aging, maybe. Um, but we tried some out and it's, it's decent. I mean, it's wine and it's certainly drinkable. Um, that is the main that, requirement for a beverage. Yeah, I mean, it's quite, it's kind of sweet and sharp at the same time. Um, it's oh. quite nice, actually. It's grown on me. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, I've only ever met one wine I couldn't drink. And that was the free bottle that we got in the college pub quiz at uni um which I then accidentally broke all over my carpet when we moved out of um uni accommodation and tried to hoover it up with the Henry Hoover so (laughs) and how did that go I worked (laughs) but I wouldn't want to be the next person to use that Henry Hoover no I think you probably killed Henry no (laughs) did I get Henry (laughs) fatally drunk um anyway the wine's nice so <laughs> that's all right then. <laughs> i made i made blackberry wine uh what about you um i have been getting back into granny squares Ooh. I, i've been feeling very broody lately and like okay. not anywhere near the point where i can do anything about it but i'm channeling it into making some single blankets for the future are you nesting I am nesting. Excellent. How big is? The I don't think I'm going to be. Um, just just a couple of single ones. So like, mm, cool. Like five by seven kind of large squares. Hmm. I'm trying to think if I've baked anything. I must have baked something. I remember what I was going to say earlier, which is that I have dye seeds, and I'm going to try and grow dye plants. Um, oh, cool. So I've got some Madder, Dyer's Greenweed, and Woad, which isn't as difficult to grow as I thought it was, apparently. Um, well, Woad just kind of shows up, doesn't it? Kind of, it's kind of a weed. <laughs> I didn't realise that. <laughs> so, saying about yarn and things, I believe you've been researching Shetland lace? Yeah, I have indeed. Um, So this is a really, really cool historical aspect, I guess. I mean, it's still a thing, so that's cool. Um, The both of us kind of are already familiar with Shetland lace as knitters. You made a Shetland lace wedding shawl. I did. It was bright blue. And it was very awesome. soft because it was merino. It was so cool. Um, and it, it, it was went... also a pain in the behind. <laughs> yeah, so um, just for anyone who's not come across it, um, Shetland lace is a style of knitting from the Shetland Islands at the very north of Scotland. And it's very delicate open work knitting that's often the the main 
things that you make with it. So do you just want to define open work? Sure. So you're, it's basically the, the garment has got lots of holes in it, but on purpose. And it makes like a, a pattern like lace. Um, yeah, if, if you think of a, an even more elaborate doily. Yeah, I guess. That, that's, I mean, doilies yeah. are most people's reference point for the concept of lace, I think. Yeah. Okay, so it's like, um, it's that kind of fabric. Um, traditionally, they're made from the wool of Shetland sheep. And it's, that shawls especially, they're very, very delicate they're made from like really thin wool on tiny tiny needles um i have got a shetland lace project that i'm doing i've been doing for quite a while um which is on like two millimeter needles with cobweb weight thread or uh, yarn it's yeah it's i mean cobweb weight is basically just thread isn't it yeah yeah basically um i mean i can't even spin that then um so they're made with this very thin wool. Um, they are mostly garter stitch. They're fiendishly difficult because they're patterned on both sides. So normally where you would get, where you were knitting lace, you would get one side where you just did like a plain stitch. But you have to do the lace stitch on both sides on tiny needles with tiny yarn. Um, it's, yeah, it's just really, really difficult. And they have this, specific construction um where traditionally you would start by knitting the border and then work inwards although I, some modern patterns i think go the other way where you do the middle first and then knit the border on um, yeah my shawl was middle first cool. so the shawls are probably the one that's most known for the most famous one is the wedding ring shawl um which is when some of them are so white they're up to like two meters wide but you can pull them through a wedding ring because they're so fine which is amazing um lizards fits through a wedding ring i've seen it so they're made from the wool of the shetland sheep which is a uh, native breed to the shetland islands and it's one of the finest british sheep breeds um so the wool has like a really nice crimp a really nice kind of curl to it that keeps that traps the heat because when it's spun into a yarn it has these air pockets which the heat gets into and it has like a really cool a really nice soft halo around it, which makes it really good for fine work. Like so when you say sorry, when you say that the sheep themselves are fine, they like by what criteria is that? Like what what makes a sheep attractive? I mean, I I like a good sheep. You know, personally, I would just be like, that is a fine sheep. <laughs> like, it may be controversial, but my favorite breed of sheep is the black face because they're just really really cute with their tiny tiny faces that are so fuzzy <laughs> oh i mean the south downs have like really kind of chubby teddy bear faces which is adorable like those nice. are some of my favorites but shetland are quite they're very hardy as you would probably expect um shetland does not have the most famously nice climate um and the finest wool comes from like the throat and the underbelly of the sheep so that would be combed out for the shawls traditionally um so apparently i mean we don't know it's kind of shrouded in the mists of time but shawled. knitting oh, shawls in the mist of time <laughs> But knitting supposedly came over to the islands from Scandinavia in the 1500s. Um, I can't remember, were the islands owned by Scandinavia that, at that time, or was that uh, Norway? Like, I think. Or... Okay, sweet. Or that oh. might be Orkney. I'm I'm sure the Shetlands have some connection to 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 I think Norway. They do. I'm sure there's some like. 
I'm, there's definitely some like Viking old old Scandinavian names in the Shetland Islands. Um, but I mean, the the north of Scotland did have a lot of Viking influence generally, so it there, make there sense. were Vikings just all over the shop. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's thought that that's how knitting came to the islands, um, and then. By the 18th century, there are records of Shetland Islanders being involved in the hosiery industry, the most exciting of industries, um, <laughs> making stockings, uh, both coarse and fine stockings, to be sold all over the British Isles. And by, I think, the late 19th century, it's estimated about 20% or, t- or even two thirds of the islanders were involved in the stocking trade but that's that's a lot because that's that's more than just like a gender split that's just a lot of like the majority of families yeah that's a lot i mean by that time i guess the knitting machine had been invented so or like the kind of hand operated knitting machine so Mm. Yeah, I guess you would have a lot of people involved. Um, Shetland lace as a thing didn't really become famous until it became associated with Queen Victoria. Ah! So in 1837, Arthur Anderson, who randomly is the founder of P&O Ferries, presented a few examples of Shetland lace work to Queen Victoria. Uh, He gave her some stockings and she immediately ordered 12 more pairs of stockings. And then she basically became a fan and she was often seen in shawls from Shetland and like other knitted garments. And um, she's often actually, I think, in photos wearing a white shawl which is a Shetland shawl and the white work was quite popular to have like white lace shawls. So then that became... So is white work just stuff that is white? Yeah, literally just white goods. Um, so then that became really fashionable because everybody likes to copy the Queen. Um, although Queen Elizabeth II's fashion for headscarves hasn't really caught on but in quite the same I'm sorry way. when is the last time you've seen an old lady not wearing a headscarf yeah but is that I mean you can't know that they're all doing it because of the queen that's true it could just be the queen's doing it because she's an old lady oh which came first <laughs> <laughs> it's the big question it is asking the big questions on bread and thread podcast Although I I have seen like quite a few older ladies in Liverpool in the supermarket and their curlers, so maybe that's that's just Liverpool. Just another thing. Yeah, maybe so. (laughs) I've never seen the Queen do that, but (laughs) I mean, I I grew up in Warrington, where people would just go to the supermarket in their pajamas. That's fine, though, right? Not the corner shop, the big supermarket you have to drive to. I feel like that could easily have been me. <laughs> I did. I I'm, I'm not judging. I'm just saying it's a thing. <laughs> I've definitely been to the corner shop in my pajamas and dressing gown. <laughs> I did put like outside shoes in though, which was very mature of me. Mm. <laughs> so with the patronage of Queen Victoria, Shetland lace work became really fashionable, especially the shawls. And they commanded really high prices as they were so so delicate and so incredibly fine and time consuming to make. Um, but as you oh, might back said, when artists were paid what their work was worth. Ah, uh, yeah, mm, about that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> of course. Exploitation. <laughs> yeah. Um So, thanks to uh, our good friend Capitalism, um, as you might expect, the actual knitters in Shetland didn't make that much money from their work. 
Um, it was definitely a vital source of household income and a way to earn extra money to support their families. But they rarely had the chance to sell directly themselves, obviously being in the Shetland Islands, which is quite difficult to get to. Mm -hmm. um, often kind of brokers or middlemen would come round and buy the shawls or they would take them into like a local shop that could be traded for goods or they could be paid by the shop which would then sell them on so unfortunately the makers of these incredible delicate items probably didn't get paid what they were worth um and certainly not uh, a proportionate percentage of the price that they would be sold for like in london yeah that tracks um but a pretty significant proportion of the shetland islands was involved in making them i think um i've seen a lot of really cool photos i'll try and um, post some to the twitter or get some links of um women outside their cottages with these big frames for dressing shawls so like when they were finished um because with lace work you can't really see the pattern until you have blocked it which is when you get it wet and then you pin it all out so that it dries in a stretched position so that you can see all of the little holes properly so because these shawls were so massive they would basically block them on these big frames and leave them to dry outside. So I'll try and track down the picture of that because it's really cool. Um, and the patterns of these shawls um, and the tops of the stockings and things have these really lovely names that kind of reflect the, the Shetland landscape, like Print of the Wave, Old Shale, Cat's Paw, fern or candlelight um oh, like, those are lovely it's very cool um and often uh, most of the time people wouldn't even be using a pattern like these would just be passed down by generations in like the female side um just having these incredible patterns in their head um, which they would then just knit up in whatever configuration they liked into these shawls. So the earliest piece that's in the Shetland Museum, which I desperately want to go to <laughs> one day, <laughs> is a christening shawl from 1837. Maybe um, when we get enough patrons, we can <sighs> we can take a trip. Oh yeah, research trip! Woo. Uh, there's also <laughs> like I think it's called the Unst. Cultural Heritage Museum or something um, in Unst. Be really cool to go to. Mm -hmm. So throughout the 19th century, these shawls were really, really popular. But at a certain point in the 20th century, wearing shawls kind of went out of fashion, which if you ask me is a shame because it's basically a blanket that you can wear. I mean, who wouldn't? Yeah, I have been seen wearing shawls to work before now, and that's not going to change. You are a fashion icon, and I salute you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I have also worn shawls on occasion, and I like as a knitter, making shawls is fun, and you want to wear them. But also, yeah, they're kind of great. So, bring shawls back. That is that is our podcast's real mission. <laughs> That is the the agenda to bring back shawls and cloaks. I do have a cloak. I made a cloak. You made a cloak. It's very good. It's got armholes, so I can just like be all cozy. And then if I want to <laughs> grab something, I just poke out like a snail. Oh, like a really warm tortoise. It's a good time. That's great. Um, yeah. So wearing, but wearing shawls went out of fashion in the 20th century and so the demand for those kind of hand knitted goods dropped um but i did find this out and i 
had never heard this before. In the 1920s, these blouses of Shetland lace work became popular as knitters on the island tried to update their stock, essentially, to reflect modern trends. And so there are these amazing, I'll link to this as well, uh, the Victoria and Albert Museum have these amazing Shetland lace blouses, which were considered really daring at the time because obviously it's full of holes. Well, so, yeah. Yeah, you have you to wear like see your underwear. or something underneath it. Um, and they're just, they're beautiful. I mean, I would 100% wear one today. Um so, yeah, that can, that, but still using those traditional patterns in lace work. So that continued on into the 1920s. Um, unfortunately, shawls not being completely back in fashion. Um, and also now with people, with the push for people to get paid um, <laughs> for what they're actually doing. Uh, a hand knitted real Shetland shawl now costs a lot of money, um, which is fair, but... Well, yeah, I mean, even just getting enough of that delicate wool spun to make one must take, what, weeks? Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you can still get one that is made from hand spun as it would traditionally be from hand spun wool um you probably maybe you can somewhere i would think you probably couldn't unless it was just made for you by someone who wanted to mm. um but i think there are a few people who who still make and sell the knitted shawls um so although it's not in fashion today it's uh, still around as uh, it, it still retains its cultural significance. Um, it's still quite well known in Shetland. And I think the Queen of Norway was given a Shetland shawl as a present when she opened the Shetland Museum in 2007. That's um, really cool. Yeah, it is really cool. And there are quite a few modern knitwear designers that use Shetland lace pattern. So I'm going to give you some of my favourite ones that I've found. And it's now kind of in, in knitting circles, the coolest circles. It is, it's kind of a, a challenge to make a Shetland lace shawl. Like Having it, made one, I can confirm it is challenge mode. <laughs> It's a bit of a bucket list thing for a lot of knitters. Mm. And there are some absolutely incredible patterns out there. Um, like the, the Heirloom Knitting Forum has created free patterns of a few um, traditional designs based on pieces from the Shetland Museum <coughs> or, from the <coughs> or from the Arts Museum. And these things are like massive tiny needles just thousands of meters of threat of yarn um like those are proper show-off pieces um kate davies um he's quite a well-known designer uses a lot of shetland patterns she's the designer of the owl sweater the owl jumper um and a lot of the elements are incorporated into modern patterns um and modern designs um one of the main retailers um, of Shetland wool today is a company called Jameson and Smith, who purchase about eighty percent of the Shetland wool crop. So wow. there's still, yeah, that's sort of keeping the keeping the sheep industry going. Um, and they describe themselves as a wool broker. So they buy up the wool from the farms, from the crafts, and then they produce their own yarns. So they produce knitting yarns and um, they also do the specialist yarns for Shetland lace, the really thin ones. Mm -hmm. And then they also will sell the wool they don't use on to 
companies who will make it into clothing, into rugs, um, things like that. Um, so yeah, here we are in the modern day and Shetland Lace is still going. That's really cool. I didn't know it was still such a big thing. Yeah, it's still an industry. I think the knitting itself um, is not so much like a big industry anymore as like a cultural kind of thing. I mean, I could be wrong. Um, I wasn't able if you're to from talk. Shetland, let us know. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Please do. Um, but definitely the production of Shetland wool and it its quality is still as good as it ever was, I guess. So, um, yeah, I think it's really cool that that's still going and that company is still based in Shetland and sort of keeping that alive, um, which is great. Oh, I forgot my favourite fun fact that I found out as well. Um, okay, this is not a connection that I would ever have thought to make, but... In 1897, Queen Victoria presented a Shetland lace shawl as a gift to Harriet Tubman. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's so cool. That is, that's probably my favourite fact of this week. <laughs> yeah, that about uh, wraps it up for my short history of Shetland lace. Cool. So before we move on to local ladder, um, I just want to talk about our Patreon. Um, so if if you do want to support us, you can do at patreon.com slash bread and thread. Um, oh, cool. If, um, so you can support us at different tiers. So at £1 a month, um, you get access to our Discord server. Um, where we just talk about various things that we're making, just trying to build a community of makers and crafters. At five dollars or pounds, whatever currency, um, we will be posting patron exclusive recipes and possibly patterns um, for you to have a go yourself. Uh, I'm gonna um, try and do some patterns. There's currently the recipe for my Banoffee cookies from last episode up there. I want that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can have it for free. Um, or at 10 monies per month. Um, we're going to be posting monthly instructional videos for various cooking and crafting things. So you can learn how to do th these things yourself. And if you do make anything, please tweet at tweet us at bread and thread we would love to see what our listeners yeah, are up awesome. to i mean i can't i can't 100 percent promise that any instructional videos i make will be like you know foolproof but they will be entertaining <laughs> <laughs> so um for our local food portion i've been looking at stargazy pie wow this is exciting okay i know what this is but i i've never like seen or eaten one and i don't know anything about it so so a stargazy pie is um supposedly is from the town of well it's spelt mouse hole but i believe it's pronounced mosel I think it's like that Mosul or Mausel because I remember reading a a book, a children's book about a cat who lived in in Mausel. Does seem like a good place for a cat to live, and you'll find out why in a minute. Um, oh. but yeah, it's it's a delicious pie. It contains fish, potato, grated egg, various mm. herbs and spices, and fish heads poking out of the crust okay. um as though they are gazing at the sky that's random 
So, do you want the historical stuff, or do you want the legend first? Oh, definitely the legends. Like, this is what I want to believe, so... So, the story goes that there was a fisherman in Mausel named Tom Borcock. That's B-A-W-C-O-C-K. <laughs> sorry, sorry, what? Tom Borcock. I don't know why you're laughing. This is a clean podcast. <laughs> um, so the legend goes that the village was facing starvation because there just hadn't been enough successful fishing trips lately. And he sailed out into a violent storm facing certain doom and oh, instead no. returned with a huge catch of seven different types of fish which were made into a pie and shared amongst the, t- the townsfolk. It's, it's a story that's actually celebrated every 23rd of December um, in a pub in Mausel um, where they make... The, this pie with seven kinds of fish and sing a song which I will put a link to in the show notes about Tom and his saving of the town. <laughs> I'm I'm so glad Bullcock was saved. He is the hero of Mausel and <laughs> I love and support him. <laughs> we we love Bullcock. We do. I the best things happen in pubs. Like there's a pub in Lewis that has a national pea throwing competition. Like shelled peas or just whole like pods? Oh no, you like the, the I don't know why themselves. I need to know. Yeah. Say again? The peas themselves. Yeah, you just like you just like eat them, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> You eat the peas. Of course. Yeah, anyway, that is a great story. So, more historically, um, the this pie goes back to at least um, the at least 1800s. Um, a reference to it appears in the journals of Captain Frederick Hoffman, um, who mentions a pie made of pilchards with their heads peeping through the name. Um, Everyone in this tale has such a good name. They really do, don't they? Um, and yeah, he talks about... He's, he basically compares this pie to potted flying fish that he encountered in Barbados. And he basically talks about how he's worried that, you know, there's the similarities of cuisine between the two places, but he doesn't think that he'd he'd be able to get stargazy pie outside of Cornwall. (laughs) Um, It also appears in Halliwell's Dictionary of Archaic and Provincial Words. In 1847, which also mentions putting leeks in the pie, which (laughs) I haven't come across outside of this dictionary. (laughs) Just J.O. Halliwell is like, no, you put leeks in this. There's no no evidence for leeks anywhere else. We didn't. Maybe it's nicer with leeks. Maybe sometimes you've just got to take a leak. Um, but it is still made today, not just um, for this celebration in Mausel. It's kind of a display dish that you might make just kind of like, hey, look what I did. Kind of like how we were talking about the pond pudding last week as being kind of a... It's a thing to put in the middle of the table as much as it is a thing to eat. I guess, I mean, I imagine that you probably wouldn't I mean especially nowadays when you don't generally pick up fish heads at the supermarket I mean that's the advantage of pilchers is they're they're quite easy to buy whole okay 
cool. I stand corrected. Um, yeah, it's it's Pilchard is is just another. It's kind of a sardine adjacent. <laughs> um, the tent they're generally used interchangeably, but they are. It's kind of regional which one you use. I I'm more used to calling them pilchards because I'm from north. Okay. But it's it's basically a sardine and potato pie. Oh, okay, yeah. I I get that. I get that. Oh, that's... I mean, they're not very big, are they? Sardines. No. You, t- you tend to get a decent number poking out. Oh, quite often seven because of the story. Okay, that makes more sense. Because I was imagining, like, big fish heads. And then I thought, what if they're sardines, which are tiny? Is it going to be just, like, a few? Or is it going to be, like, a forest of fish? <laughs> Yeah, a lot of the pictures I've seen, there's kind of a ring of them around the outside of the pie. Kind of seven oh. or eight. That's a decent number. Yeah, I mean, it's it's quite convenient. In um, Dorothy Hartley's Food in England from 1953, she actually suggests cutting the pie between the fish in order to portion it. That is a good idea. It's like when you get a birthday cake and there's like a chocolate button or something on each slice and then you cut it up between them, except instead of a chocolate button, it's a, a, it's a fish, fish head. For the <laughs> I mean, I'm sure nowadays no one is going to be expected to eat the fish head. Although, I mean, sardines are quite small, you could eat that whole. I mean, yeah, I probably eat the fish head. So yeah, there's there's not a lot of information about Stargazy Pie. This is most of what I was able to find. But I just I want to know what the seven kinds of fish in this traditional twenty third of December version are. Oh yeah. Does anyone Presumably say? one of them is pilchards. But I, I I didn't see any like lists of the fish. <laughs> Presumably it's a closely guarded secret of the the pub where they do it. I, mean, I could probably only name seven kinds of fish, so I guess it's those. Like it's probably mostly white fish. How many fish are there? How many fish are there? I'm I'm gonna go with several. <laughs> More than seven. Oh, I forgot to mention the name of the pub, by the way. It's the Ship Inn in Mausel. So okay. if you're ever nearby on the twenty third of December, known as Tom Borcock's Eve. Um you can <laughs> you can go and eat this bizarre pie. So yeah, um, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I certainly did. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you have an, an episode suggestion or a local larder suggestion, you can email us at breadandthreadpodcast at gmail.com. Or, like we said, you can tweet at us at breadandthread. No, I was meant to say that, wasn't I? You can tweet us at breadandthread on Twitter. And we'll see you next time.